Scientists have just discovered a Sicilian fossil that pushes back this modern group all the way back to the late Triassic. Join Dr. McLean and myself as we discuss the implications of this find for the young age creationist community. Well, g'day, it's Ken Colson here from Creation Unfolding. Uh, we're back again uh, with Dr. Matt McLean doing a interview type segment with him. Uh, I do want to uh, put a, a plug in for the Masters University uh, where Dr. McLean teaches paleontology and uh, geology. Uh, look, if you're interested at all in going to a six day uh, creationist school that's specifically focuses on that well at the same time covering all of the evolutionary data then you want to go to the master's university i actually graduated from there in 2002 and i wish they had this program this geoscience program there then so uh dr mclean uh welcome back yeah thanks for having me yeah so today we're going to talk about sicilians yes and we're not talking about italians that's correct right no Italians today. No Italians. <laughs> so, um, okay. Well, first of all, I think you just better tell us, you know, what is a Sicilian? What, what is a Sicilian? Yeah. So um, most people, you talk to them, they've heard of an amphibian, right? So this this uh, animal with bones, right, that has legs and things that can switch from being in water to land. Okay. So we talk about frogs are the really obvious one, frogs and toads. And then, you know, most people are going to know about a salamander or a newt um, or an eft, same kind of creature. Um, so it kind of looks like a lizard, but it's actually an amphibian. Um, but there's a third type of living amphibian that many people don't know about. And those are called Sicilians. Um, they have incredibly long bodies, look like a snake, kind of. Um, sometimes they'll have little legs, sometimes no legs at all. And um, they're actually amphibians. So they've got, you know, the kind of the slimy skin you're familiar with, and they they need to keep moist. Uh, most people have never heard of them because they only live in tropical, subtropical areas um, where it is very wet and um, they live typically underground. A few live in the water, um, but they're really, really interesting animals. Actually, a lot of them give birth to live young um, as opposed to laying eggs. And um, some of the ones that give birth to live young, the babies will actually eat shedding skin of the mother um, as their first meal, which is a little bit yep. strange, um, but but interesting, you know um so they're they're really cool animals um they're every once in a while you'll find a zoo or an aquarium that has some um but they're they're really interesting okay um and so you talked about amphibians uh yep. there so uh where what do evolutionists believe about sort of the origin of amphibians yeah so um when we talk about amphibians living amphibians um they're like i said there's those three basic types you got frogs salamanders and sicilians um, those are collectively called a group called Lysamphibia. Um, and that is a small subset of all the things that have ever existed that we actually call amphibians. So there's all kinds of things from, you know, giant, um, crocodile sized animals, um, that could swallow you whole down to things that are uh, really tiny and have like boomerang heads and all kinds of crazy stuff going on in the, in the fossil record. So how do those things relate with the things we have today is the big question. Um, you know, so when we first start thinking about amphibians, um, and you think about how does an amphibian develop, right? We, we tend to think of frogs and tadpoles, right? Um, and the tadpole looks like a fish and it grows legs and goes on land. And so you think, wow, that sounds a lot like the evolutionary story, right? That four legged animals came from fish, but it turns out that no fossil amphibian that's not a frog does this. And even our other amphibians, Salamander Sicilians, they don't do this either. So this idea of having a tadpole seems to be something unique to frogs um, and has nothing, even the evolutionary model will tell you, it has nothing to do with the origin of amphibians at all. Um, instead, they would say um, all of our uh, tetrapods are four-legged animals, so amphibians, birds, reptiles, and mammals. Those, they say, share a common ancestor um, with some kind of fish-like creature like Tiktaalik. Um, and that what some of those grew legs, right, evolved legs over time. Um, and some of those went on to land and then they, they diversified in a bunch of different types of animals we call amphibians in the fossil record. Um, but not all of those are close relatives of the living amphibians, what we call the list amphibians. There's all kinds of weird stuff I was talking about. And so the big question is where did the living amphibians come from? Which of those weird extinct groups of 
amphibians are actually close relatives. Um, and so I'll show you a little little chart I've got over here that that um, it's going to throw a few names at you, but it it will hopefully kind of be helpful um, to understand this. Yeah. There's been two traditional ideas for where amphibians have come from that have been major. And I'll show you a third one as well. So um, there's these animals called temnospondyls and there's other animals called lepospondyls. These are both extinct groups of amphibians. And um, traditionally, people have assumed that our Sicilians, our frogs, and our salamanders form a group together. We call this amphibia. It's a monophyletic group, meaning it has one evolutionary origin. And so the question is, are they descendants of the temnospondyls or are they descendants of the lepospondyls? Okay, so those are kind of the two big things. Temnospondyls, all kinds of wild stuff. A lot of these get really, really big. Lepospondyls tend to be really, really tiny amphibians, and they're probably not actually a true group. There's probably, um, they just threw everything together because it's tiny. They're actually different origins for many of those in the evolutionary model. But those were the two big debated areas. But a third possibility also comes in, which is that actually Sicilians don't have the same ancestry as frogs and salamanders, that they're not close relatives. And so we'd call this polyphyletic, meaning there's different origins for them. So they'd say maybe frogs and salamanders are actually temnospondyls, whereas our Sicilians are lepospondyls. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been proposed in the literature. And then even a fourth option where it's a combined polyphyletic and temnospondyl hypothesis. And so the point of all this is just to say it's pretty chaotic. Where did amphibians come from? Bunch of different opinions out there. Um, and that's been a big debate that's been happening in the literature for decades now. Um, people arguing about this and trying to figure it out. Okay. Now, uh, for the audience, I've got, I'll have photos up there. I'm going to paste some photos in there so you can see what some of these animals actually look like. But let's talk about this new discovery. Uh, yep. What is this new animal? Uh, this was from a paper, I believe, was it, was it published just this year? Is that, that right? Correct. Yeah, it, it came out just recently. Okay, so brand new paper. Um, and of course, Dr. McLean is a paleontologist, follows a lot of these things. Uh, so, so tell us about this new discovery. Yeah. So um, the animal of interest is called Funcus vermis. Um, that's the genus name. Um, Funcus. The Funcus vermis. Um, so the full name is Funcus vermis gilmori. Um, the last part's named after a person named Gilmore. Um, but fungus vermis means funky worm. Okay. And <laughs> yeah, that's so, um, like I said, Sicilians kind of look like worms. Um, they have these long bodies. And so, um, the, the name actually is named after a 1972 song called funky worm by a band called the Ohio players. Okay. And of course, yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I listened to the song. It's, it's a strange song. Okay. Um, but, um, What's interesting, I mean, there's no word for funky in Latin, as you might expect. So they had to kind of figure that out. Um, they basically just made a Latinized version of the term funky um, to make it funcus vermis. Um, interesting. Yeah, I know, right? I um, there as well, so people can... Actually, do yeah. they have a photo of this funcus? I, I looked at the paper. They didn't have like a... Uh, like an artist's depiction? Yeah, I can show you one. Okay. Um, it's right. in the paper later on. Uh, it's in the supplementary information. Okay. Um, do you want me to share it or do you want me, you are just going to put it I'll on I'll pull later? it up. I can pull it up later. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Okay. So, so how um, does this Funcus vermis thing help yeah. in the origins, this origins debate going on in the evolutionary sure. community? Right. So, um, you know, first thing I want to say is that th this is a, um, the fossils of this animal come from the upper Triassic chin Lee formation in um, the United States. Okay. So, um this is important because we don't have any Sicilian fossils that are that low in the stratigraphic record or from an evolutionary perspective that old, right? I mean, it's old for both of us, but they're going to say millions of years older than our currently oldest known Sicilians. What are we talking about from a secular perspective? So that's going to be, um, you know, you're going to be looking at like, uh, I mean, it's in the 200s. Um, let me see if they give like a more specific. or something like that. Yeah, about 220. They say, they say, um between about 223 to 218 so about 220 million years old okay. um and so uh um, that's the, the oldest fossils, sicilian fossil. this is now the oldest sicilian at 220 the next one yeah. up how old's the next one up? uh it's it's um early jurassic okay. um so i would say probably like under 200 so like maybe 180 170 something like that be okay. my guess um so the fossils of this um we don't have the whole body, unfortunately, 
Um, it's mainly pieces of the jaw, um, but there's a bunch of them. So they found just tons of these things. I think they estimate, let me see, yeah, at least 76 individuals were present here. So tons oh, of these little so funky it's not worms. Just one fossil, it's no, like no, it's not just one. So it's a whole bunch of them. Wow. But it's like pieces of the jaw. There is a little bit of the skull. And then there's like a random femur. There may be a few other pieces, but there's not much going on. Um, but they have lots and lots of jaws. And what's helpful is the jaws of these of Sicilians are really distinct. Um, and so I'll show you one of the ways um, you instantly can recognize this as, as being something of interest. Um, so they've got the special teeth of our lysamphibians. So frogs, salamanders, Sicilians all have these pedicellate teeth. That, these so that's teeth the that are on these pedestals. Uh, all of these that, images here from the fossil? These are all from the same creature. Yep. Okay. Um, and these are the jaws. So this is like the lower jaw. And you can see the little teeth right yep. here. Okay. Yep. So uh, where the teeth would be, these are the pedestals that the teeth are on. Um, and that's a distinct feature for our, our uh, living amphibian groups. And having two rows of teeth in the lower jaw. So you can see there's one there. And then there's a second one um, that's more inner. That's a, that's a classic Sicilian trait. Um, as well as showing up in a few of our others. I'll see if I can now, uh, just show you that here. You talk about teeth, because frogs don't actually have teeth. Yes, some do have teeth. Okay. Some species are completely toothless. All right. Only one frog out of over 6,000 species has true teeth on its both upper and lower jaws. Okay. So there you go. You're right. Most of them don't have teeth. Okay. Um, and you can see that right there with Rana. Um, that's yeah. a frog. But the salamander right there, you can see tons of teeth. Yeah. Um, but this second row of teeth is really common for Sicilians. And so Funcus vermis is right here among some extinct and living Sicilians. So like Sicilians will have some fused skull bones, like the maxil and the palatine fused together. And so we see this in Funcus vermis also. So it looks like a Sicilian. I mean, it, it seems like it. And it's much earlier than people had found them before, which is, is cool. Um, and so they're saying this thing is not only a Sicilian, it clearly links all of the um living amphibians list amphibians as a single group they are one group and they're in the temnus bundles uh, when they did their phylogenetic analysis um let me see if i can show you that um here you've got sicilians are right here in this group gymnofiona there's funcus vermis it's a stem sicilian it's on the way there in the group gymnofiona morpha that is the sister group to our frogs and salamanders that's petrachia right there Okay. So they're saying when you do the phylogenetic analysis, it does show up as, um, and here's a bigger one, and you can see it's inside of, um, they're a monophyletic group, they're a single clade, they're inside of temnus bondoli. Um, so they're saying that solves the problem, or it helps anyway, um, of the origin of amphibians. Okay. But let me just explain, it's a little bit more interesting than that, because a few years ago, this animal, let me see if I can highlight him here. Chinle oh, here he is, right here. Chinle stegophis. Okay. So interestingly, a few years ago, somebody found another thing they claimed was a Sicilian ancestor. Legless guy, the exact same formation, Chinle formation, in the exact same continent, North America. And they're saying this proves that um, the Sicilians are not in a monophyletic amphibia. They said they're actually a different group of temnus bundles called the stereos uh, stereos bundles. So just to show you really quickly right here, that's this idea right here that they are polyphyletic, but ultimately all within temnus bondoli. So how do we reconcile these two things? Well, their new phylogeny in this new paper, they say Chinle stegophis only looks like a Sicilian. It's convergent with Sicilians. So what they're saying is in the Chin Li, you have two different types of amphibians that both kind of look like Sicilians. One really is, and one's just pretending. And they're and both burrowing they, around in the ancient first, sediment. The first paper, the original paper, they were saying it was a Sicilian? Yep, they were saying it was a Sicilian and that Sicilians actually belong in a different group of temnus bundles from the frogs and salamanders. They're actually separate. But this new paper says that thing is not a Sicilian. Funcus vermis is a Sicilian and brings the Sicilians back closer to the frogs. And Why would they say the other one was not a Sicilian? Um, so you can read the paper to get an all involved detailed anatomy, but essentially when they did their phylogeny, it shows up as the stereospondyls. It's not with the other ones. 
Okay. Um, so they're saying that was a red herring. Um, you know, this is the actual true Triassic Sicilian. Okay. And why is this so, I mean, like why is this pertinent for us as creationists? Yeah, I mean that's that's the big question, right? What what do we do with this? I mean, number one, you've got the exciting discovery of of a new species. That's always exciting, right? To think about the glory of God being revealed in a way we didn't know before. So that's great. Number two, this extends the fossil range of a group, right? We're always interested in that as creationists. We think that the the kinds that exist today and in the fossil record must have been there from the original creation, right? They change within the kinds. You get different species and groups within the kinds. But you should be able to trace them back. And so that's cool to find another Sicilian lower in the fossil record. So the big thing that's interesting for me, right, about this as a creationist is it's getting to these questions of how do we define these groups? And how do we decide when something is true homology versus a homoplasy, right? Because you've got this thing that... What's a homoplasy? Yeah, yeah homoplasy is when you've got... Um, so we talk about homology and analogy, right? Um, so homology is the same structure or organ with different functions, right? Whereas, or you know, various functions. Whereas analogy is the same function but different structures, right? Um, so like the wings on a bat and a bird and a pterosaur. Homoplasy is when you have analogy that looks like homology, basically. So you've got a structure that looks like it should be from common ancestry, or looks like it should be homologous, but it's actually not. So, um, so for example, just to clarify, like homology would be like the hand, a human hand, and yep. uh, uh, the foot of uh, uh, the whale, a whale flipper, and yep. a horse foot. So they have the same bones in them. And the idea is <laughs> the reason they have the same bones is because they all come from a common ancestor. They all can the evolutionary model. Yeah. An evolutionary perspective. Yeah. And analogy would be where uh like flight is in pterosaurs, birds, and uh bats, yeah. Yeah. but uh it's not connected in any way to uh uh, to a single common ancestor the flight in those three organisms sort of evolved according to the evolutionary model independently correctly uh, and yep. therefore that you can't draw a connection yeah okay and so homoplasy then is going to be where it's really masked right um where you you are you are convinced that something is a homologous trait but then it turns out no actually this is just convergence this is just something that looks like it's from common ancestry but it's not okay. um so even the structure itself is remarkably similar uh, right. not just its function and so you're thinking about this like wow um why do we have multiple groups of amphibians that are worm-like that you know are acting like worms or snakes kind of things in the same environment in the past and what is that telling us about the way god designs things um and so i think that that's that's a big question and um, one that we're not going to be able to fully tease out here in terms of what does convergence mean and all those kinds of things. But one thing I do want to point out that's really interesting about this article um, that was kind of, I wasn't really expecting them to get into this at all, but they do. And that concerns another animal we got to bring up and his name is Jerobotrachus. Okay. And Jerobotrachus was found um, quite a few years. Well, it's in the 2000s, I think. I, was a, I saw know, a photo of this. It's kind of like something looks like a frog between a frog and a salamander. Yes. A yeah, tape. so they call it the frogamander. That's what, that's what they like to call right. it. And it's supposed to be the the conclusive proof, right, that frogs and salamanders share a recent common, or, you know, share a common ancestor, right. um, that they're a single group. And um, so this animal, when it was found, it was hailed as, oh, this is the transitional form, right, between frog, you know, for frogs and salamanders that, right. that connects them. Um, back to the amphibama forms and, and other temnus bundles. So um, their analysis that they're doing um, is recovering Jerobotrachus um, actually not at that point where frogs and salamanders join, but outside of that, farther back, even farther back than the point that connects Sicilians with frogs and salamanders. So you got to step it back even more. There, Jerobotrachus is, and so they say in their article. Let me find the the quote here. Okay, they say the recovery of Jerobotrachus as the sister taxon to Lysamphibia in our analysis suggests this taxon may not be a stem batrachian, 
and should be used with caution as a minimum age calibration for lys amphibia. Okay. So in other words, what they're saying is this that. animal is, I know, right? They're saying this animal is not actually really the frogamander. Um, it's not really showing that it's actually more distantly related, um, even outside of the group that contains Sicilians, which is really interesting from a creationist perspective, because they're telling us, oh, this is obviously the point when frogs and salamanders originated. And they're saying, no, actually, it's not. Um, and then they take it one step farther. This is where it gets really fun. Okay. They say in this paper, a divergence time estimate for Lysamphibia ranging from the late Devonian to the middle Pennsylvanian epochs with a mean in the middle Mississippian and a median in the late Mississippian. Okay. Why, why does that matter? What's that time, okay. time frame? What are we talking time frame here? Yeah, so let me um let me pull it up here. I'll give you a visual. Okay, so we can we can look at this. I think this will help. Um Okay, so your first list amphibian fossils are in the Triassic. Okay? So Sicilians, frogs, salamanders, that group. They're in the Triassic. We still have today. Oh, 200, yeah, the ones we still have today. Bound in the 200s, right? Yeah. Most people were assuming that they evolved then or maybe in the Permian, right, for their origin, okay? Right. So maybe at most late 200s, or I guess early, how do you think about it? The big number 200s, you know, 250 to 270, 280, something like that, right? They're now pushing this farther back all the way before the Permian into the Carboniferous, so in the 300s, mm -hmm. or maybe as far back as the Devonian, so that's over 350 million years ago. And why are they doing this? They're doing this from their, this is their estimates they're getting from um, molecular clock analysis, in now, modern, including in this modern, new information. Modern, modern animals. Yeah, from using modern animals, and then they're tying in the fossil evidence to help them think through this, right? Right. So why does that matter that it's getting pushed farther and farther back? Because this is a big jump from where they thought it was to now way, way back in the Carboniferous or possibly even Devonian, okay? Right. This matters because that's the origin of tetrapods as a whole, okay? We're talking about the first tetrapods in the fossil record are the uppermost Devonian. Mm. Most your amphibian, major amphibian groups, so the temnospondyls, the lepospondyls, um, all those those animals that are considered um, stem uh, amniotes, so things like anthracosaurs and, and diadectomorphs, all of those have a Carboniferous origin um, in, the, in the evolutionary model. They're, they're, and their fossil record starts in the Carboniferous, okay? We're now pushing our living amphibian origins way back all the way. Their group appearing at the exact same time that all the rest of the amphibians show up. That's yeah. really, really pushing it back. And yeah. so what you have to have at that point is essentially another Cambrian explosion, but for your amphibians. Right. So basically That's where this gets really exciting. We're talking about, uh, yeah, like you say, like a Cambrian explosion type phenomena where all of these uh, amphibians just sort of turn up. Yes. And um, let me show you. So um, we already kind of were thinking something along these lines with our extinct groups of amphibians. So when you look, your first tetrapods are in the uppermost Devonian, things like Ichthyostega and Acanthostega. There's pretty much a gap of not finding tetrapod fossils called Romer's Gap. They're finally starting to fill it in with some random groups here. But once you jump into the Carboniferous, you have tons of different types of amphibians that just pop onto the scene, right? Now, drag your modern amphibians all the way back down there, too. Right. We're adding one more there. And so all of your, your tetrapod groups, um, probably including, you can see Amniota there, the reptile group, um, that would also include birds and mammals, they're all being dragged back to that Carboniferous, almost Devonian Carboniferous boundary. Now, when you say uh, the you're talking about this uh, Lysamphibia, right? That's the one that's yep. being dragged back? Yeah. Okay, so that would include, uh, so that would that mean then that there were sort of frog-like organisms, Sicilian-like and salamander-like, modern, sort of modernish like animals back then? So it would mean, um, you know, when you look at the chart I showed earlier, um, Essentially, you'd have something, you'd have frog and salamander-like animals, at least by the Permian, and Sicilians, at least by the Permian. But you'd have, they're saying, the Lysamphibian ancestor, and possibly some animals kind of like those things, all the way back in the Carboniferous. 
Right. which means they have a massive ghost lineage, according to this molecular clock estimate. I mean, your earliest um, fossils of these things are upper Triassic, lower Jurassic, right? So you're extending it by potentially um, the, the group's origins by like maybe 100 million years, maybe more, um, which is a really, really big ghost lineage. Now, do you think, I mean, obviously we're talking about evolutionary data and interpretations. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that there are some in the evolutionary community that will say, uh-uh, this ain't happening yep uh, why would they say that why would they say look you can't do that yeah so we got to remember with molecular clocks um these are estimates right these are these are numbers they're generating based on um you know how quickly they think evolutionary changes can happen and you know like there's a stable rate there and everything all that kind of stuff you're not actually looking at fossil evidence right so it's very easy to say hey no actually um you know, uh, we don't have the fossils to support that. And maybe they evolve much more rapidly than the molecular clock is telling us. Um, I mean, okay, <laughs> you're still looking at really rapid evolution of, of certain groups, whether whether it's a rapid burst of evolution at the beginning of the Carboniferous, or whether it's, you know, tons of amphibians of the Carboniferous, and then less amphibians popping onto the scene later in the Triassic, right. you're still looking at some kind of problem like that. An alternative would be they'd say something like, we think you're wrong about um, that all your list amphibians share a common ancestor, right? They use one of the other hypotheses. Okay, well, now you've got to support that with fossils and you've got to explain fungus vermis and what that means. And so all of this to say amphibian origins continue to be a really, really hotly debated and fascinating topic um, to look into how there's so many opinions flying around and it's not really a settled thing at all. Um, these new discoveries keep shaking it up and moving things around and shifting them. Right. Um, and so when you see a diagram in a book, you know, so you see something like Jerobotrachus, the frogamander, or you see, you know, um, a phylogeny or um, something like that, it can be really tempting to be like, oh, that's what they know, right? No, these are hypotheses. Right. Um, and you got to remember that, that, yeah, they're they're based on evidence. There's fossil data and there's things they're using to come to these conclusions. But that doesn't mean that these are true and right. Um, there's so much we don't know. And all it takes, like I just said, is one fossil discovery. They find this new animal, Funcus vermis. Right. And suddenly you're overturning the hypothesis of Sicilians being over here. Now they're over here. And now you're pushing the amphibians way down in the fossil record. Right. And that was just from one discovery. So yeah. who's to say what they'll find next in a different spot, the Triassic or Permian or wherever. I think that from a creationist perspective, I mean, we would, I mean, we always talk about we want discontinuity uh, between yep. fossils, but in reality, uh, we should probably expect a lot of continuity uh, between different kinds of organisms. And so when we see something like Joe Petrakis, right, uh, the frogamander, you've got to be careful because if you have an evolutionary uh, worldview to begin with, you look at that and go, oh, yeah, I see. Uh, that looks like uh, something in between. Mm -hmm. um and so uh I, that's something that we as creationists need to be careful about that no i mean god god can totally make these kinds of critters that look like sort of in-betweens but that doesn't mean that they actually are an evolutionary you know, uh, reality right so something can be morphologically intermediate right it can look kind of like one thing and kind of like another thing without automatically being an ancestor right. um and so what, the more you study the amphibians of the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic, the more you see this thing everywhere. There's all kinds of random stuff. There's an animal called Wachiria, where um, people have been debating this for decades, what exactly it is, because it'll have features of one group and features of another group, features of another group, and they'll say, maybe it's transitional here, maybe it fits in here, maybe it's there, and it's, it's just a big mess. Right. Um, and I think that... Um, you know, yeah, we don't expect there to be a grand tree of life in the sense of continuity being the only ruling thing, right? We also expect punctuated discontinuity. Right. We expect there to be created kinds. So, you know, maybe, for instance, Sicilians are a created kind. Um, they are still unique. Even when you look at this fossil Sicilian, they're still expecting it to kind of look like a worm, right? They're not expecting it to be, you know, transitional in morphology to a, a salamander frog ancestor or something. Um you know, but yeah, you're right. Sometimes you find an animal that looks kind of in between two other animals. Does that automatically mean that it's a it's an ancestor for them? No, not necessarily. Um, and that's what we need to remember is that the diversity of life we have today is, I shouldn't say diversity, I should say disparity. So yeah, we have, 
I think over 6,000 living species of frogs, right? Not including fossils. That's more than all the mammals that are alive today. That's crazy. But you know what? They're all frogs. They all have the same body plan, right? When you look in the fossil record, you have tons of different body plans of amphibians, mm -hmm. things that you didn't even know could exist. Mm -hmm. And so we need to remember that, that um, there's a, there's a spectrum of things that God makes, right? And God made, I should say it's, it's creation's done. Um, and we are discovering more and more of that spectrum, the more we dig into the fossil record. And so we can't be surprised when we find things that kind of look in between two other things we already knew existed. Mm -hmm. um, we need to take a look at that deeply as creationists and say, is that actually an indicator that these two things are part of a single created kind? Or are we looking at a third possibility we didn't know was there, right? And maybe it's three created kinds. Um, and that's where we want to do good methods um, and things like statistical barominology to try and figure these things out. Mm -hmm. Cool. And so I guess some, some of the main points here would be, uh, one, uh, we would expect to find uh, discontinuity, but we'd also expect to find continuity. So we don't mm -hmm. want to discard continuity uh, in the fossil record. And, and, and in this particular example, uh, we would expect to find uh, fossils that are sort of out of place. Would that be correct to say? Yeah, I mean, the, the way I'd say it is, um, as creationists, we expect that the animals we have today, the basic kinds, must have been there in the original creation, right? And so we should consistently expect to keep finding them lower and lower in the fossil record um, right. because we think they were around. Um, and that's what we're finding, which is cool. Um, that's exciting. Funkus vermis is an example of that. Sicilians are down even in the Triassic. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's a really cool discovery. Um, and I think we'll expect more and more and more of that moving forward in the future. And I would say as a as a final kind of big picture thing to think about here is, is just a reminder about, you know, these evolutionary trees you see are always hypotheses um, and they're not certain. Um, and they'll say that in the evolutionary community too. And so when you are looking at one of these things, just because you see something that looks like a convincing story or narrative doesn't automatically make it true. Right. Um, and you need to um, to realize that so that you're not, you know, thrown off or terrified just because somebody makes right. a really good narrative based on on some data. Absolutely. Yeah, we do need to remember that uh, the, you know, the evolutionary position, Darwinian uh, position, um, it is a worldview. Um, and, uh, you know, there is definitely a philosophical uh, backdrop and foundation to that worldview. And, uh, you know, Paul tells us in uh, Colossians 2.4 uh, that he says these things that we may not be led astray by convincing uh, philosophy you know, by, by, by arguments that sound convincing. Uh, we've got to be steadfast in the word of God. So, um, well, look, uh, Dr. McLean, absolutely uh, fascinating uh, discussion today. I don't think I've quite got everything there, but I think there's a lot of pieces that, that are sort of coming into play. So I uh, just want to thank you uh, for joining us today and uh, I'll be excited to see what we, uh, what we discuss next time. So yeah, uh, thank absolutely. you, Dr. McLean. Uh, and of course, everybody, uh, don't forget, uh, if you enjoyed uh, the segment that we had today, please go ahead and hit that like button. Uh, great for the Google al algorithm. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, ring the bell for easier access to more videos as they come up. Look, I've got a website as well, www.creationunfolding.com, uh, where I go into some detail in some of my other uh, types of videos and write some articles as well. There's a book if you're interested. And look, there is a uh, a new PayPal button in the description. Uh, if you are so inclined to donate, I'd really appreciate that as well. And of course, the most important thing as always is prayer. So if you could pray for me right now, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you and goodbye.